the war being over, me parents went down just to eke out a living in old London town. There I was born, but their smiles turned to frowns as they thought of their home in the Northland. Of Kendall and Carlisle, of the Tees and the Tyne, of the mountains, the lakes, the moorlands so fine. From the backbone of England, see a country of mine that I wouldn't exchange for another. The long days of childhood form memories still of the move up to Kendall. And the birth of our Jill, of Christmas and sledging down Old Castle Hill, and the house where we lived by the river, of Kendall and Carlisle, of the Tees and the Tyne, of the mountains, the lakes, the moorlands so fine. From the backbone of England, see a country of mine that I wouldn't exchange for another. We moved next to Carlisle in the land of the wall, with its river, cathedral, its castle, and all. I remember the team that I saw rise and fall, and the day that we won at Newcastle. Of Kendall and Carlisle, of the Tees and the Tyne, of the mountains, the lakes, the moorlands so fine. From the backbone of England, see a country of mine that I wouldn't exchange for another. Now I'm in the northeast. I'm a bit of a joke. I'm a Cumbrian Geordie who was born in the smoke, and although by my accent I'm a strange sort of bloke, well at least. I know where my home is. It's in Kendall and Carlisle, the Tees and the Tyne. It's the mountains, the lakes, the moorlands so fine. From the backbone of England, see a country of mine that I wouldn't exchange for another. Hello there. Well, if you've joined me in my study, I presume that you've just heard me singing a song about uh, my own family background and we'll know why I've got this interest in family history. Uh, the song was written in the 1970s and covered my birth in Wembley and moved up to Kendall when I was a couple of years old, then up to Carlisle when I was about seven or eight, across to Newcastle University and to Sunderland and working in Hartlepool for a number of years. Um, I'm here to talk to you about tips and hints on how to use the Genealogist website and uh, we'll be starting that in a few minutes time. Um, it's probably useful to you to know that the reason that I've been chosen to do this is because I really am a technological novice and to be quite frank if I can use this website then anybody can. Right so the first thing we're going to look at here is the way that the Genealogist uh, website works. You'll see here that there's a number of different search engines. Uh, the top three there are the most popular, but I've discovered that there are a number of others which are also extremely useful. You'll see the top three here are a, a person, an address and a family. And I'm going to take you through those three first to show how they can be used. Finding a person. I just wonder how many of you out there who are watching this uh, talk have been doing your family history for quite some time. I started back in the 70s and I know that I wore out a lot of shoe leather going around trying to, uh, to find some of my ancestors. And I've chosen one of them, or one family in particular, just to illustrate 
how easy it is nowadays with modern technology and with a site like the gene genealogist to find these people. So let's have a look at what's here. There's a person in the census, all years, all counties, and I've just put his name in there, Thomas Greatrix, with a keyword of Derbyshire, and I know that he was born in 1832, but you'll see there that I've put plus or minus two. I always think that's quite a, uh, a clever thing to do because there are often stray uh, in either direction when it comes to records. And this is what turns up. And you can see here, there's a whole list of um, census entries, which you can access from here. All you need to do is to click on one of those names and they will get you to a digitized copy of the original um, census. Um, and if we move on to the next one, you'll see there that uh, he moved around a bit. This family were all uh, gamekeepers for years on end. And if we go through it, you'll see that in 1841, as a youngster, he was at Alveston in Derbyshire. Uh, in 1851, he was in the next village. Uh, he, he was working as a, in the leather trade. He then moved to Wellingborough in Northamptonshire, where he, he worked on the, the railway as a railway porter. And that's where my great-grandfather was born in 1860. He then moved on to Lypole in Herefordshire, uh, where he was a gamekeeper up to Dinsdale in Durham, where he was a gamekeeper, to Armourthwaite in Cumberland, where he was a gamekeeper, and then back to his wife's native area, Buxton in Derbyshire, where, despite his age, he was still a gamekeeper. Now, you can imagine how difficult it was to find all these uh, census entries. It meant going around and looking at the original copies. Nowadays, it is quite straightforward. If you move on to the next slide, you see an example of a digitised copy of the original there. This is for when he was living at Dinsdale in Durham. And if you look on the left hand side, you'll see the old mill house. And there's Thomas, a gamekeeper born in Derbyshire in Alveston. And if you move down one, two, three, four, you come to Daniel there, who was my great grandfather, also a gamekeeper born there, Wellingborough in Northamptonshire. And you can see how the family moved around. So that's how you can find a person in the genealogist website. An address. Uh, this is a, one of my favorite ones, in fact. Uh, I find it very useful, not merely for family history research, but I do a lot of social history research. I uh, did uh, quite a lot of work on lads from our local rugby cricket club who went to war. And I've done quite a bit of work about uh, seafarers in Sunderland, people who were involved in shipbuilding, filling the ships, sailing them. And to be able to find an address is absolutely, uh, is extremely helpful. And what I've done here is to show you how I've managed to find things out about my own house. That's it. Uh, a couple of years ago, somebody knocked on the door and said, I think I've got a picture of your house being built. That's it from the rear there. You can see it's a large Victorian house um, and it actually has another house beside it. It's in the middle of a terrace. So you can see it really is being built. There are no windows in there and uh, scaffolding's up. And when we actually uh, had the house redone recently, we found uh, some very, very early wiring. You can see there the, the wooden slots through which the in the Victorian times, they, they took the, um, the wires for the electricity. And even some of the original wallpaper turned up as well. And that's what the house looks like from the outside. This is uh, old industrial Sunderland. Uh, we're very fortunate uh, in that uh, a lot of the houses are in parks. And uh, with things that have been happening recently, that's very pleasant to be able to get outside there into the park. So, what about the history of a house or an address? Well, this is the way it works there. It's quite a simple thing. See the master search at the top there? You put in an address. You decide which census you want to use. If you remember the census every 10 years. You decide the county and you put in the name of the street. 
if it doesn't work at first I wouldn't worry too much about it because you may find it's spelt a different way for example I was looking for a place called Thornhill Gardens and it wasn't until I separated the thorn and the hill off as two that it actually turned up so keep trying there. Now if you look down there it's quite straightforward to find the elms in Bishop Wearmouth which is the the name for the part of Sunderland that uh, we live in now on which actually it is the main part of Sunderland there so you would click onto the elms and you click on to you find number eight and our house was built in 1873 and in 1881 there was a family called Davison in who had actually had it built he was um, a grocer in the high street in Sunderland so quite a considerable man explains why we've got so much nice wood in our house it probably came in uh, with the ships coming back with timber on them. They were still there in 91. In 1901 there was a family called Adamson here and finally in 1911 there was just a cook and a maid. I'll come to that a little bit later. Right so the first thing you get up for the elms is something like this and you can see that this is still um, an index if you like. You'll see there that way down at number eight we have uh, Robert G. Davidson. So let's click on and see what we've got there. At the bottom of the page there, number eight, Robert G. Davidson head, uh, a grocer employing 7M, 6B, 1G. Um, that's seven men, six boys and one girl. Um, his wife is born in a place which is called Painshaw, but is known locally as Pincher. And that's how it's spelled here. Now then, hang on to your hats. We have a 12-year-old, 11-year-old, a 9-year-old, an 8-year-old, a 7-year-old, a 5-year-old, a 3-year-old, a 1-year-old. And gentlemen, if you're watching, we have mother-in-law age 72. We have an aunt age 68. We have uh, a niece who is a governess, pupil teacher, a housemaid and a nursemaid. Um, it's a big house. It's four stories. And this explains why he needed a house that size with all those young children in it. If we move on uh, 20 years, we come to the Adamson family. John W. John Weston Adamson, age 34, a ship owner on the new shore, it says, and an employer. Uh, and his wife, Lily M. And one, two, three, uh, three children. Uh, sorry, no, there's two children, a governess and three servants. So that's the Adamson family. He was a very influential man in, in Sunderland. We now have a problem because what's happened to the house 10 years later? And there we are. We have Kate Moses, the cook, and Margaret Dodds, a domestic housemaid, and that's all. So how do we find out who actually lived in the house there? Well, this is where I tried a little bit of trickery. We know about the wife. It's an unusual name, Lily May. Lily May Adamson, Sunderland. I've gone back to the person one here. So if you look at the top, the person in the census for 1911, anywhere in the country with the name Lily May Adamson. She probably was born in Sunderland. Well, she was, wasn't she? it said Sunderland. And she was born in 1878 or around there. So fingers crossed, let's click and see what happens. And there we are. In 1911, of course, everybody did their own individual um, uh, entry. So here we have the Adamson family uh, at Mount Pleasant in North Allerton. It's what I usually describe as a mini Downton. Uh, the honest truth is that our house was his townhouse. He only came here when he was working or when probably um, uh, in the in the winter the family would stay down at North Allerton but just have a look at the the size of this household there's John and his wife there's Lily May there that's got us into this one and then there's one two couple of daughters servant uh, another daughter visitor governess a nurse and a whole lot of uh, servants there um, we've actually seen in the house there, it's still there on the fringes of North Allerton in North Yorkshire. 
and uh, the last time we looked there uh, it was used as a manufactory of toilets. The third element is finding a family. This is very, very useful. Again, if, um, if you're searching out a particular family, and if they have a, an unusual surname, uh, it, it cuts down the amount of people you've actually got to look at. Um, what I've chosen to do here is, is, is to choose a well-known Sunderland family called the, the Pickersgills. The Pickersgills were ship owners. I had to do some research into them. I knew uh, a lot of them were called William. So this is what I did. I put a family. I decided to start in 1881. I knew they were in Durham. So is there a family anywhere in 1881 with a William Pickersgill and a son called William? And this is what we got. 1881, cottage, William Pickersgill, shipbuilder, Ellen his wife, William a son, Alfred and Joseph living at 36 Clockwell Street in Sunderland, which is, is down by the river. It's actually down by where they manufactured the ships. Uh, now that information opens up all the other censuses, uh, 51, 61, 17, up to 1911 if you want to find them. Uh, I thought we'd look a little further backwards. So if you look at the top there, family, 1871. The Pickers Gills. He was born about 1848, she about 1846. Let's put the information in, cross our fingers, and there we are William and Ellen. Same address, probably. They often change the numbers on the streets willy nilly. And all you need to do will be to click on and you get the original, the, the digitized version of that. Interesting here, you see. It, it, eventually Pickersgill was going to be one of the biggest shipbuilders in Sunderland. Some of you may have heard of Austin Pickersgill. Well, he started life as a, as a draftsman. Many of them did. You normally find with shipbuilders that the, the first one is the man who's got all the skill and uh, sometimes it doesn't pass down the family. So, does he go back any further? Let's have a look. Let's go back to 1861. Uh, William born 1848. We know that. Was his dad called William as well? Family, 1861. Pickersgill, William, William. And there we are. Camden Street in Sunderland. Again, close to the river. We have a William born 1823. And his wife, William, the son we know about. Charles, Sarah, Maggie and Frederick. Um, and we're back to 1823. So really all the censuses we can see nowadays, 1841 to 1911, they're all opened up there for us to find out as much as we uh, can by going through the, um, uh, the normal sort of single name search engine. Now, so those are the three main ones that uh, people tend to use. And I must admit, when I first started, I didn't stray much from those. But these other search engines are extremely useful as well. Here are the trade, um, uh, the books that were given out, which sort of listed uh, where people worked and, and where they lived as well. Sometimes in these trade directories, the same person will get three, three entries, sort of an alphabetical one. Um, one for where they lived and one for where their place of work was. And it also mentions telephone entries as well. So <clears throat> let's keep up with the Pickers Guild, shall we? So we're looking for a person in trade, residential and telephone. I think you've probably got the idea now of that. The left hand side one there has the person, the address and the family. And the right hand one tells you which particular type of records uh, you're going to be looking at. So, what have we got about any William Pickersgill in Sunderland? And here we have an extract from um, one of the trade directories. And we'll see there, there's a whole load of them. There's uh, Charles is living at the Elms North in Sunderland, which uh, is very close to my house. Uh, it was actually bombed in the war and had to be knocked down. There's Frederick in the next street, 37 The Avenue. And Miss Pickersgill. Azalea Terrace, just round the corner, and there's William 
at three the avenue so this is a bit later than the, what we were looking at before but they're all there and they're all living close to each other this is William's um, work address there Crown Road Suddick as it's pronounced in Sunderland so as I said before uh, these records uh, you get the work as well as the home address as well and I thought well is there any more in here about the guy who lived in our house John Weston Adamson a person in trade residential and telephone in Sunderland there let's have a look at that and in 1921 we've got him down there at the bottom there County Durham still at eight the elms now if you remember the last time I came across John was 1911 in the census um, he actually died in the late 1920s and the funeral went from outside his house and we found a photograph of it in the local newspaper another search engine worth in looking at is the military one and again uh, I'm going to stick with the Pickersgill family because the the youngsters of the next generation served in the uh, First World War and they were um, uh, both members of the cricket and rugby club that I studied so going up the top there I think we've all got this now a person in this case it's in the military search engine it's Frank Pickersgill and I knew that he was in the artillery of some form now you'll notice here that there's a mistake I made at first. The year of event has got nothing to do in this case with where they were born or married or anything like that. It's where the information comes from. And to cover the First World War, I would put in 1916 plus or minus two. So if there's any reference at all to them in the First World War, that's four years to choose from. You'll see at the bottom there that there are six results. There's Frank mentioned in dispatches, is in the Northumbrian Brigade of the Royal Field Artillery Territorial Force, a major, a temporary lieutenant colonel, and he's been mentioned in dispatches there um, in June 16 and January 1917 as well. So he was obviously a, a brave man. As soon as I saw that he was a territorial, I decided that I'd do something with the uh, years at the bottom there. You can see it's a person military, frank, artillery again, but if I extended it, so I'm asking for records covering from 1906 to 1926. And if we look down at the second from the bottom there, you'll see Pickersgill, FL, TD, 15th of August 19th, 19th of November 18th, it's got some information there. And at the bottom, 1906 army list ignore the first Dorsetshire this is actually in the Durham section and there we have can you see at the very bottom Frank L Pickersgill 14th of October uh, 1905 he became a lieutenant so it, in, in fact um, it was quite a long serving uh, uh, part-time soldier and uh, that's probably why he got his promotion interesting the two lads there were both rugby players. Frank was a, a cricketer and a hockey player, but the guy at the top, Norman Cox, actually played rugby for England and the three of them served together in the First World War. Uh, you'll see Frank at the very top there as well uh, in 1908. So it, it, it's useful there. There's, there's quite a, a wide, um, a, a broad lot of information on, on military history going uh, back into the 19th century. Uh, just have a look at an original record that's his uh, mention in dispatches the original document again these digitized copies are invaluable when I first started researching I, I would say to people try and find the originals because what you looked at online in the early days were hand copies they weren't digitized digitized copies are fantastic they're better than ever because you can actually blow them up and so they're better than the originals in some cases um, there again you see we've got some more information there about him being in the third Durham's there uh, 14th of October 1905 as a lieutenant and once again 
one, two, three, four. Everybody but Brearley there actually played rugby together. An interesting fact. Charles Pickersgill was his cousin. Could I find out anything about him? Durham Light Infantry. Notice that I've put 1960 and I've put five years in. I could also do eight, I could do two, depending on what I'm looking for. And there's Charles in the 7th Durham Light Infantry Territorials, second lieutenant, and he's wounded in 1915 and appears on the casualty list. If you're still looking at First World War information, you'll find there's a lot of different kind of uh, um, documents uh, with information which you can use. I also decided, uh, because recently we've been looking at the Second World War, to see if I could find about somebody who was in the Second World War. Uh, a guy with an unusual name called Lester Little. Um, he was a hockey player in our local club there. Let's go through it again. A person in military called Lester Little. Uh, I've put 1942 plus or minus 5. So that'll get me from 37 to 47. And there, the sad news at the bottom there of his death. Uh, second lieutenant in the Royal Artillery and that's something which I can follow up further. And there we are again. The original uh, document with the information of where you can find out uh, the details of his death. Wills. Now you're probably aware I think if you've been doing a family tree for some time that uh, not everybody had a will certainly before the middle of the 19th century but it's worthwhile trying to see if they find them. My wife's case, she had an ancestor who was a, a cabinet maker in London. And uh, so we decided to see if he would turn up. A person, right, in Wills, his name was James Cragg. We know that he died in 1833, so we've put in that plus or minus two. Um, I, I would add, if, if the plus or minus two gets a lot of hits, then go to one, then go to zero, um, and just keep on trying. The only thing that turns up is James Craig, cabinet maker, uh, making his will in 1831. So that is definitely him. And this is what we get on the screen there. Again, uh, if you see the original, uh, it's often difficult to read, but you can, you can blow this up. Um, you'll see at the so top there, it's James Cragg of Francis Street in the county of Middlesex. And just under the James, you'll see Cabinet Maker. And if you look down one to about five lines, there's the name of my wife's ancestor, his son, John Cragg. And it says he's leaving him all my printed books, etc. And further down, about four or five lines from the bottom of the left-hand side, you'll see uh, another son called Joseph Webb Cragg mentioned. Uh, really interesting character. Uh, joined the East India Company, went out to India and became on a tea committee. And we found him as uh, the secretary of a tea committee which, which brought back uh, Assam tea to the UK for the very first time. So um, it's worthwhile having a look at wills to see if one turns up. Now this is uh, one which I only started using a couple of years ago, but I found it extremely useful. Uh, looking out at tides, uh, mostly sort of around the time that Victoria came to the throne um, and landowner information. And you may think, right, why, my family were not very rich if they lived in the countryside, but you'd be surprised who turns up in this particular one. Now, uh, Way back, if you remember, we dealt with the, the Greatrix family. The first thing we did, the Greatrixes were all gamekeepers. And um, Daniel married a, a lady called Selina Woodward, who had a reputation in the family for not always telling the truth about her age and a variety of things. And one of the things that she said on her um, marriage certificate was that her father, Daniel Woodward, was a farmer. And we discovered when we looked at parish records for the early days that he appeared to be, uh, uh, sorry, um, when we looked at the census records, that he was put down as an agricultural labourer. So we just thought, oh, Selena's at it again. 
Anyway, I decided I'd put Daniel's name in. Let's have a look at this. A person in the Tithe and Landowner series um, in Derbyshire. Um, an unusual name, Daniel Woodward. What turns up? Well, there we are. He lived in this place just outside Buxton called Taddington. And from our researches, we knew that he was the only one in the village with that name. So he turns up somewhere in the tides, paying tithes. He must have had some land to work on, which he, he had rented or owned. A bit of a surprise. And there we are. One, two, three, four at least mentioned as, as belonging to him. Now you see on the right hand side there, there's various things you can move to. And one of them is an actual map. Of, uh, of the tithes there. The village is on the left hand side. Can you see the small cluster? And there's one of Daniel's fields that he had uh, about 1840. Uh, it belonged to the Reverend Henry Cook or Cook and Daniel occupied it. And I was thinking to myself, I know what's happened here. Uh, because when I was a teacher, we had this lovely little film uh, about the enclosure of, uh, of England. And one of them had a, a little man in a field on the very edge of the village, having been given four fields in the enclosures, saying, I can't cope with this. I'm going to have to sell and become a labourer. And it looks to me, is this what may have happened to Daniel? His three or four fields may have been enough to keep him going, but he's way out of the village there. And have a look on the right hand side, there's a river. So the land there is likely not to be all that great it probably flooded uh, not the best quality land and uh, and so I think maybe Daniel was a sort of farmer at one point and maybe Selina was telling a half truth there and we discovered this simply by thinking I wonder whether he appears in the tides or not um, the next thing, and this is very recent, we now have this wonderful thing called the Lloyd George, which is gradually being brought on by the gen genealogist that uh, when Lloyd George was prime minister, he, he wanted to, to discover um, about who owned what. Uh, it, this was the time of the liberal reforms when they were taxing people a little bit more. And uh, one appeared of, uh, online uh, of, of London. Now I was born in London, in fact, uh, I was born in a hospital, but my parents lived at 28 Leghorn Road when I was born in the 1940s. So I went into Tithe and Landowner, person, and I just put 28 Leghorn Road into the key words there, and look what turned up at the bottom. R. Thorpe owned 28 Leghorn Road, Wilsdon West, which is Halsden, and it's there in the Lloyd George Doomsday Survey. And you would click on to one of the little... Uh, icons at the side there and there's a big map of where it is today and there is another one of where Leghorn Road uh, was um, at the time of the, the Lloyd George and as I blow it up a little bit there there it is on the right hand side and you can see why I was destined to become a uh, a famous musician and artist. I was born just round the corner from Wilsdon Hippodrome. But there we are. You see, you can see very, very closely where a particular um, address is. And then we get all the details of it here. 28 Leghorn Road, its value of the, uh, the land and the buildings, the name of the owner. Uh, interest, it was leasehold um, and freehold as well, it says there. At the bottom there, it says weekly, and then fascinatingly, nine shillings per week each flat. Now, if you remember, this is in Edwardian times. It's the very early 20th century. But I remember there, my parents told me that when they bought this house in London, they lived on the top floor and they rented out the bottom floor. And in fact, they were probably a whole house, but it had always been in flats. And there we see it mentioned. So that answered a question I always wondered about. Court and criminal. Uh, I suppose that there are people uh, who are looking at this talk who have, uh, have had pe uh, people who have been sent off to Australia or ended up in, uh, in prison. Uh, there's a very good search engine for this one. 
and um, we decided to try some of my wife's family. We were very fortunate when I first met my wife in the 1970s. There was uh, a relative who was 100 years old and bright as a button. And he said that some of his great uncles had been sent away to Australia. So we decided to find out if we could say anything about them. Their names were Windley. They were from Essex. So we decided just to put in Court and Criminal and Essex and see what we could find. And you can see at the bottom there, we've got some transportation records. Let's move into detail there. We have a William Windley on the General Stewart. He was tried in 1880, he was sent out for life to New South Wales and he arrived in December 1818. Um, details going down there. His brother, there was more than one of them. A criminal record, 1816 in Essex for larceny. Uh, if you look above the second bottom one, we have William Windley again there. Convict pardons new. Um, you're probably aware that a, a lot of the people who went out there were quite clever people and when released uh, made something of themselves. And, and one of William's descendants was one of the first great Aussie rules footballers in fact. And there's more of them. We have an Elizabeth in 1870 uh, for larceny and we have more details there about John Windley. These, these are definitely in, in my wife's family. We found them uh, in the parish records. The name of his ship, the Coromandel, uh, 1819, sent off to New South Wales and Van Diemen's Land. That's second from the bottom. And still in 1862, keeping up uh, appearances for the family, we have Philip, who was a, a nephew on the ship, the York, in 1862, sent for six years uh, um, uh, off to Australia. Newspapers and magazines, again, extremely useful. They're the, particularly if London or the First World War, there's a lot of magazines on here. And I also highly recommend the British Newspaper Archive. Uh, it costs uh, a smallish amount a year to use it, but it's an incredible site. Um, I'll show you here how I managed to use the, um, the site here. A person in newspaper and magazines called Robert Chambers. And I was doing some research into professional oarsmen or boat rowers on the River Tyne um, and the Thames. And I knew he, uh, uh, he competed on, on, on the Thames and the Tyne. So I just put Tyne in and I knew he was around from 1850 till mid 1860s when he died very young. And this is the type of thing you get there. You actually get the extract which names the person uh, and it's highlighted as well. So you'll see the top one, there's a, there's a boat race there between Henry Kelly of Fulham and Robert Chambers of Newcastle in 1859. Um, 1868 there, it's about his funeral. That's the middle one, buried on Sunday, 60,000 attended. You can see there's a little thing mentions Bob. His nickname was Honest Bob. Um, if you think of older people, remember Bobby Charlton, the footballer. Very similar uh, kind of reputation that he had. In the bottom there, uh, there's a public subscription in the memory of the late Robert Chambers. And there were uh, 30 or 40 hits on him where you can build up uh, information on a person. And uh, the War Illustrated are on and uh, when I was doing the researches into my local rugby club uh, I noted a lot of them joined the local Durham Light Infantry and this photograph turns up and lo and behold it says that most of the soldiers here were from Sunderland. So uh, that's a really cracking photograph as far as my research is concerned and that comes through the newspaper one. Occupational. Right, now then, uh, this is uh, one I've only started using recently. Uh, my ancestors, Shetland ancestors, were all master mariners. So, is there anything there about their apprenticeship? Because the apprenticeship records have gone on as one of the occupational ones uh, of people who were later to become ship's masters. And there, second from the bottom, we have my great-granddad's oldest brother, George 
who was born 1832 in fact there's the name of his master 1849 he came down from Shetland and he enrolled in the Mornington at South Shields and uh, the middle one there uh, James Pottinger is also a relative and a Pottinger at the top there working for Milvane on the Britannia which was one of the uh, great big sailing ships which went out at the time if you click on the right you'll get the original version of these if you look fifth one down there you'll have James Pottinger and you'll see that his apprenticeship he was one of the brothers he was one of my great grandfather's brother the name of the original ship he was going has been crossed out and the one that's in all his official records is that one there uh, John Dryden's vessel the moderation which he went on to and if you look on the right hand side you'll see that's North Shields and the date there is uh, 1861 so very very useful for my researches there education um, there are quite a few records here uh, education mostly for public school and grammar school boys um, there were three brothers in my research into the local rugby club called Ritson and uh, it, it said that they went to Sedba school the rugby playing public school just put Ritson in Sedba education records person I think you've all got the idea now of the way this works and this is what turns up this is, if you remember this is just the uh, uh, on the left hand side is the kind of index you go on to the right to get the original records see Francis up there at the top there which house he was in who his father was when he left uh, who his relations were middle one Edward Arnold and at the bottom there you'll see Bernard Francis and at the bottom there uh, the fact that they they tend to enter information about uh, what they did in the first world war uh, if they were given anything for bravery or <clears throat> were killed it's normally mentioned in the school registers now, <clears throat> now the, the latest thing as far as I'm concerned is this wonderful thing called map explorer and uh, as I mentioned before my family came from the Shetland Islands and if you have a look where it says Lerwick and you come down from the K you'll see it says the Teng just beside the L of Clift there a tiny lonely little place with one single croft in it and that's where my great-grandfather was um, married from in uh, 1876 and uh, the way map explorer works is that you can overlay maps so the earlier one was from the 19th century here's a more modern one you can see the 10 quite clearly and if you go to your left across you'll see purple where another uh, branch of the family came from and if you go down from purple you'll see Duncan Schlett where the others came from as well so I find this very very useful in working out where my Shetland family came from and here is our house in 1893 there you can see where the little arrow is I've put on that's our street um, and the church on the corner there and this is in the 1893 uh, a map in 1893 and there it is today in fact if you look at the previous map you'll see the V where the roads divide to go into the city of Sunderland a place called the Cloisters can you see that and the Elms goes up from the Sea of Cloisters and ours is the eighth one in and that's it to end up uh, I've done a musical introduction I sometimes do a musical ending but I'm not on this occasion but uh, I will uh, show you a musician Ned Corvin was one of the great Tyneside uh, singer-songwriters actually born in Liverpool and I couldn't find him anywhere and one of the reasons was uh, everybody thought is this name this person was Cowan can you see there number 45 Edward Cowan it's Edward Corvin and it says musician and I know that because his wife was called Isabella and his daughter was called Isabella and his son was called Edward so I know for certain that this was the family 
This is 1861 and famous Tyneside singer, songwriter and musician is living in Sunderland. There he is, Catgut Jim the Fiddler. And to end up with, there's our house, the front door. And when I did this talk for one of the first times, a young man came up and said to me, I used to live in your house when I was a student. Um, and this was way back in the 1980s before uh, we took over the house. And he sent me this lovely picture of himself with his bike outside what is now our house. And he'd come to find out more about his family history. And I found out a little more about the history of my house. Well, thank you for joining me today. I hope what I had to say was useful to you. Um, you've got my contact details already. And I just hope that you enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you. Goodbye. Well, at least I know where my home is. It's in Kendall and Carlisle, the Tees and the Tyne. It's the mountains, the lakes, the moorland so fine. From the backbone of England, see a country of mine that I wouldn't exchange for another.